If you just joined and your mic is not muted, if you want to click mute, then we won't all be accidentally very loud. Happy Pride, everyone. Yeah, he's in. Hello, everyone. It's good to see all these beautiful faces. Hello, welcome. Happy Pride, everyone. Hi, Mia. I feel like Zoom needs to add a entry music option so that while everyone's waiting for people to come in, there's like a little music in the background so it's not awkwardly silent. <laughs> Where do you hit something to play on your computer? It should work. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just joking. There, there is weirdly a system setting. You could really do it. I have found this before. Where you, mm. get, you play your, your system from your computer. Oh, wow. Did not know that. I heard if you type in franchise sound, you get some. Hi really guys. Good... Hi Paula. Hi. Hi. How are you? Long time no see. I miss you guys. It has been a while. So, I so you guys know Paula is a local group lead for Moms and Men Action for the Peninsula Group. We have other leads like Mia and Lisa and Lainey um, from Mom Barb, all from Moms and Men Action. Uh, Marilyn too. I see her there. Um, okay, cool. We have Hi everyone. I think I think we can call this a, a quorum. It's already five almost five oh five, so we can get started. I'll let people in as they roll in. All right. Hi, uh, my name is Rebecca and she her. Um, and I am going to be the moderator for this conversation. Um, I just want to welcome everyone to this conversation about LGBTQ family formation among community members and say again, happy pride. Um, to get Today we're going to have a series of conversations with families in different parts of the family formation journey. Um, and we're going to start um, by having everyone give a brief introduction and we'll begin with San Francisco Supervisor Rafael Mandelman. I'll turn it over to you, Rafael. All right. Well, um... I guess I'll say happy pride, although it's, it's, a, uh, it's a weird pride. It's a very strange pride we have here, everyone. I've, I've been thinking about how this weekend um, has been different for me, and I'm sure for all of you, from any other pride we have experienced. By, by now, on a regular pride Saturday, I would have done the pride run, and I would have been up to the pink triangle ceremony, and I would have gone to a positive resource center brunch, and I would have probably gone to some other parties, and you know, now I'm sort of seeing the the, the, uh, the, the dike march off and um, maybe hanging out with friends and getting ready for an Alice B. Tokla's Club breakfast tomorrow morning and then a mart and then, you know, the parade. And so my favorite holiday of the year has been ruined by COVID-19. Um, uh, but um, I, I do want to congratulate the incredible um, creativity of so many folks, including the folks who've organized this Zoom, um, in finding other ways to, to build community and bring us together and, and, um, and, and honor um, all that has been accomplished over these last uh, five plus decades. Um, you know, uh, this was supposed to be the 50th anniversary of San Francisco Pride, um, 51st anniversary of, of New York Pride, where, you know, the Stonewall uh, Stonewall riots um, uh, kicked us off um, in sort of the modern incarnation of, of LGBTQ, uh, the fight for LGBTQ equality. Um, and, uh, you know, we, again, we will have that giant party 
uh, sometime, but we can't have it have it this year. Um, I have been. Uh, it, it is also. I mean, this has been a noteworthy um, spring and early summer in terms of um, LGBTQ history and, uh, and and civil rights. We've lost some of the giants um, uh, of of our movement. Um, you know, Phyllis Lyon, uh, who had who died earlier this year, Larry Kramer, and then uh, just this week, Harry Britt, who was um, Harvey Milk's successor um, on, on the Board of Supervisors. Um, and so, you know, we have lots of folks to, to remember and honor, at lots of incredible accomplishments over that time. Um, we, we also had that amazing Supreme Court decision um, just last week, I guess it was, um, uh, you know, finding a, uh, protections for LGBTQ people in employment, um, which we did not, uh, I mean, we hoped was in the 1964 Civil Rights Act, but had not been determined by the Supreme Court um, to be the case prior to that. And, uh, and you know, uh, not that I ever want to say anything good about Neil Gorsuch, but, um, you know, to have Neil Gorsuch, uh, you know, writing that opinion was, was pretty amazing. Um, so, Lots of things that I'm sure would be bringing, bringing us out into the streets in many greater numbers if we, if we could be. Um, the thing that has brought so many queer people out into the streets over this last month um, has been uh, the, uh, the post-George Floyd um, uh, murder uh, protests, marches, and I think it's really fitting that there is this overlapping of season of pride and this season of protest for racial justice and an end to police violence. Um, our own, you know, as a as a queer community, um, we embrace the rainbow. Um, but our own uh, the history of queer liberation has been a, a history often of fights with police um, and of of, of of protest and marching and, and demanding rights. And so I know a lot of queer folks are out. Um, uh, you know, have been part of these amazing uh, marches and, and, and protests that have happened and, and, and will continue. So, um, you know, it's, it, is, it is quite a season and, uh, and I do think, um, you know, the, the groundwork for that uh, breathtaking uh, Supreme Court decision um, was partly those marriage cases and the assertion of, um, of our humanity, of our equal humanity, um, through our families um, and as people who uh, should be able to uh, build familial relationships um, that work and make sense for us um, and, and raise kids if that's, if that's what we wanna do. And so um, I'm very honored uh, to be part of um, at least helping kick off this conversation you all are having about the unique challenges facing queer families, um, how to build queer family um, and uh, so I, I, I want to wish you well in that conversation and, and thank, thank all of you for, for choosing. Th this is one of the ways you are going to celebrate pride in this, um, in this very weird pride season. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I think next we'll um, have Alex and, oh, sorry. Um, Alex and Caroline Navarro, give a little bit of an introduction about, about yourself. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Alex Navarro, and I'm with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I am the California City Gun Violence Lead. And I am Caroline. I'm Alex's wife, and I work for a nonprofit organization for people with developmental disabilities. And um, we have two kids. We've been married for 10 years. And 10 years. Yeah, we have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. Wow, and you're here and I can't even hear them. That's amazing. <laughs> that can change. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I'm jinxing it. Um, and next I'll I ask Rudy and Casey Espinosa to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Rudy Espinosa and I'm with my husband. Uh, he's in Miami right now, and I'm in California, so we are uh, on different Zoom call, a Zoom video. Um, I uh, serve on the board of our family coalition. I'm currently the co-chair, um, and that's an organization dedicated to the advancement of equity for LGBTQ families. Uh, and I also serve 
uh, state communications lead for Moms Demand Action, hence this beautiful shirt that my cousin Alex uh, got me. Um, and this call is super important. Just the other day, Alex and I were also on another call uh, for Pride, for Moms Demand <laughs> Action, talking about uh, being members of the LGBTQ community and also uh, being people of color. Um, and all these things intersect, gun violence and, and family, uh, because uh, LGBTQ uh, people are disproportionately affected by gun violence. So guns make violence deadlier. Um, so that's why I'm here. Right, and Casey. Hi, my name is Casey Espinosa. I just recently became an Espinosa officially. Um, I used to be a Murray, now I'm an Espinosa. Um, I am a recording artist and audio engineer. I also work in the video space. I'm super honored and grateful to be here to tell our story. Um, Rudy and I are hoping to become parents within the next year. Hopefully it's going to be happening soon. So happy to be here. Um, I hope it happens soon as well. Um, and next I'll ask uh, Vice Mayor Laura Parmer Lohan to introduce herself. Hi everybody. Um, thank you so much. It's an honor to be on this call today. Um, uh, Laura Parmer Lohan, I serve as Vice Mayor for this San Carlos. And what you see behind me um, in my virtual screen is chalk art that was created last year uh, when we raised the pride flag for the first time in San Carlos. And uh, many uh, municipalities uh, quickly followed our lead within San Jose. And this year, their aim uh, at the county level with the LGBTQ commission um, under the direction of Dave Pine and was to try to get every city in San Mateo County to raise the pride flag. So uh, really pleased to see um, uh, the colors uh, go from now San Francisco down to San Jose in the area. My wife and I have been together for 30 years. And we participated um, politically um, really by way of assimilating into the community. And um, we were signed up for domestic partners when that was offered. Uh, we were married under then Mayor Gavin Newsom um, on, May, on February 14th, 2004. Uh, it was an incredible day. Uh, we had a two-year-old uh, in tow and I was seven months pregnant. Uh, I ended up, uh, the two of us, well, actually the four of us, in a photograph in New Newsweek. I got a call from my uncle um, telling me he, he didn't know that I was gay, and I shared with him I didn't know that he read Newsweek. So that was a really, really fun exchange. And um, uh, now um, I was politically activated a few years ago when my then 12-year-old, he's now 16, was really uh, disappointed in, in how... Uh, the leaders were conducting themselves and I felt at that point many had cleared the path for me and it was really my turn to give back. So um, that's how I found my way into public office and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But again, lovely to be here and uh, happy Pride. Wow, what an amazing story. My hat is off to anyone <coughs> who finishes a wedding while actively holding or generating children. Um, I uh, would next like to introduce Steve Disselhorst. Hi everyone, so I'm Steve Disselhorst. I'm an executive coach. Um, I'm on the San Mateo County LGBTQ Commission. I'm a new author. I just published my first book, Determined to be Dad, which is about uh, my journey of coming out and then creating my LGBTQ family. Uh, my husband and I have uh, two children through adoption, uh, one through the Foster to Adopt program and the other through Open Private Adoption. Um, and I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to encourage others that are thinking about uh, creating families, uh, becoming parents, uh, helping them along in their journey. So I'm really happy to be here today. Happy to have all of you here today. Um, are Alex and Caroline still on the line? I see your screen is now blank. We're still here. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Oh, there you go. Now, now you're visible. Um, I was hoping to circle back around to you and have you speak to us a little bit about your story. I know you've lived in both the EU and the US. Um, we'd love to hear a little bit more about what your experience was like in the EU and then moving to the US and how the policy differences affected you as a family. Absolutely. Um, I'm born and raised in San Francisco. And in 2006, after two years of a long distance relationship, I decided to take the plunge and move to Europe to be with Caroline. 
and we were actually married in the Netherlands and it, after about two years of being married, we decided to have children and, and basically we went to a clinic and they told us that it was going to be a thousand euros for two successful pregnancies. So that meant that each of us could have 12 tries of artificial insemination. And if it didn't work out at the ninth try, then we could have three rounds of IVF at no additional cost. So that's a thousand euros for two pregnancies. Well, I have to say it's because in um, the thing with the thousand euros is for is only for the sperm. Everything else is just covered in the health insurance. So. Um, that is what the thousand euros is for, is for the storage of the sperm, because health insurance does not cost, uh, does not cover that part, but it does not discriminate um, in who wants to have children. If um, if you cannot have children, if it's because we're two women, or if it's because you know your husband might not be able to have you know um, any uh, live sperm or anything, so. There's no discrimination in that, so that is all covered under health insurance. So the only thing we needed to provide or pay for was um, the storage of the sperm and the cost of the sperm. That's right, and so the clinic tries to match your donor with the characteristics of your partner. So in my case, Caroline was gonna be carrying first, and so they looked for a donor that had light brown skin, brown hair, brown eyes, and so, we waited for about a year until they found a donor for us and he was of Spanish descent and they called us up and they said, what do you think of this? And we were like, well, let's go for it. Let's just do it. And so um, we went and the nurse came and, and she opened up a folder and there was like a tiny little syringe and it had a tiny little bit of liquid in there. And we were like looking at it thinking that's never going to get anybody yeah. pregnant. <laughs> no one is going to get pregnant. And sure enough, a week later, she was telling me that she, she felt different and that she felt like she was pregnant. And I thought to myself, this chick is crazy because she hasn't even missed a period yet. So um, sure enough, she was pregnant on the first try, which was um, amazing. But at the same time, it sort of felt like an invasion of our relationship to have a third party uh, involved. There, there was this other invisible person who was involved in all of this. And the clinic provided medical help in, um, for psychological us. Psychological help. Yes. Um, in case we were having any sort of doubts, anxieties, or, or anything like that. And she told us, everything is going to be okay, because once you have this baby, you forget about the donor, you don't think about it anymore. And I mean, she could say that all she wanted. We still felt like it was an invasion um, of somebody else coming into our relationship because we physically couldn't have this baby by ourselves. And so once the baby came out, it was our baby. It was our baby. And I mean, uh, until you sort of realize that, you know, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. Of course, then you get people saying like, well, who's the father? And we always said, there is no father. no father, there's just a donor. And I think that that's one of the things that people don't understand is that in our situation, there will never be a father figure. And our children know that there's just someone who decided to give something away because they wanted to help us. And so um, that was her process. My process was a little bit different because I have PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And um, I was always told that I was going to have issues getting pregnant. And I always had it in the back of my mind that I probably couldn't have children. And so I told this to one of the doctors who, who saw me when we were ready. And she said, no, we're gonna get you pregnant. It's, it's a done deal. And so I said, okay. And that's when I sort of felt like this is happening for me. This is, this is actually going to, to be a reality for me. And so it took me seven tries to get pregnant. And after a while, you just start to think like, it's just gonna be another negative. And, and you get used to that disappointment every month. 
And so I thought to myself, if after the seventh try, I don't get pregnant, I'm really going to be disappointed and I'm probably going to have to have IVF treatments. But I got pregnant on the seventh try and, and it was amazing. And then when we announced it, people came up to me and they said, well, now we will know what it feels like to be a real mom. And that sort of upset me because I had been a mom already for two years. Uh, my oldest daughter had been calling me mom and I felt like her mom. And I always told her, you may have not come out of my womb, but you did come out of my heart. And so um, that's where, where we were at with that. Um, and we obviously struggled with whether or not we should have the same donor for both our children, because then they could be biological siblings. But then we thought we're already a family and we want to, yeah, it, it really didn't matter to us. We were a mixed family. And so we wanted our children to look like us. So we specifically wanted a Spanish donor for her because we wanted our child to look a lot like me too. So then we realized let's get a Dutch donor so that our baby can look like us. And it's funny because our oldest daughter has brown hair, brown eyes, and our youngest daughter has green eyes and blonde hair. <laughs> And so people automatically assume that she carried the youngest one who looks like her and I carry the oldest one who looks like me. But at the same time, for some reason, people just never understand that whole concept of, you know, who carried who, who men, you know, are you really the mom and, and things like that. So those things are, are a constant conversation that we have. Yeah. And then the other thing is that after um, Riley, our youngest one, was born, she, um, she became an automatic um, U.S. citizen, and both our kids were born in the Netherlands, and our oldest child is not, and still not, because she was born out of me, out of me even though you are, even on the birth certificate, um, the parent. Um, so those are things that we're still even working on right now. So even though, you know, you're, you are on the birth certificate, you are officially the mom, she is still not recognized as a US citizen. That's right. That, that sounds amazingly different than the process going through here on the state side. Um, thank you guys so much for sharing your story. Absolutely. I, I would, um, I have a follow-up question for you, um, and I know that Alex, you mentioned that your your youngest daughter looks like Caroline, and your eldest daughter looks like you. Um, and given that you're a, a multi-ethnic family, have you found in the states that having your children who do, who are who do have different skin colors presents a challenge um, for you here in the states differently than it did in the Netherlands? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, People seem to think that I'm always their nanny, um, <laughs> which, yeah. is, which is kind of funny, but people automatically always assume that. But there was this one instance last year when we were traveling back from the Netherlands and Riley and I are both US citizens and Caroline and Annika are not. And so we had been on a flight for 11 hours. And by the time we got here, it was four o'clock in the afternoon about almost two in the morning Dutch time. And so my daughter was super fussy. She was throwing this massive tantrum and we had to split off because it was non-US citizens and US citizens. So I take her with me and she's screaming at the top of her lungs in the airport uh, through customs yelling, I want my mommy, I want my mommy. And so people are looking at me and they're, thinking that I'm either kidnapping this child or maybe I just adopted her from this other country and she was just screaming and they didn't realize that she has two moms and she wanted the other one. And it was just so embarrassing, so frustrating. And then I got pulled aside by a, a US customs agent and had all these questions for me that had to do this passport check and, and all of that. And she didn't know where I was. I didn't know. I mean, it took me an hour to get through customs through the, the uh, non-U.S. citizen side, and you weren't there. <laughs> yeah, so that was frustrating. I couldn't take out my phone and tell her this is where I'm at, and so it just created this whole 
uncomfortable situation and, and eventually it was fine and I can laugh about it now but um, I, I was really really upset and really frustrated at the time. Wow, wow. thank you very much for, for sharing your experience. I, that, I, I hope we see change in how we are approaching families especially the international um, families. I know this is a consistent problem. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that we see our federal level policies make sure that your family does not have to fight for citizenship for one of your daughters. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I would love to talk to Casey and Rudy a little bit. Um, I know you've recently gotten married um, and you've had a long process to get where you are. I know you just had your first surrogacy attempt. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got to this point? Absolutely. Um, I'll start. Um, it's been an interesting journey, a challenging journey. Um, we've, we started this process probably about two years ago um, to get to the point where we are now. But I will say that I think my, my journey to becoming a parent started even when I was little. Um, my, my sister and I used to talk a lot about, you know, what it would mean for me to have a family. And I always told her that I wanted to take her eggs and I wanted her to help me. Um, so we started having that conversation early on and I, and I wanted to use you know, my sister's eggs since I was little. Um, so when, when Rudy and I you know, got together and we started talking about what it would look like to have our family, um, the, our first thought was to ask my sister, whose name is Kelly, to be our egg donor. Um, I didn't feel comfortable asking her to carry the baby to term. Um, but I knew that if, if she could donate her eggs and, you know, my husband could, could provide the, the sperm that we could have a baby that was genetically related to both of us and as close as we could get to having, you know, our own biological child together. Um, so that was kind of how we got into it with her. And she, um, originally signed on to it. She has a family of her own. She had just had her first child. Um, she's married. And so we started, you know, having conversations with them about what that might look like. And um, we were pretty much to the point where we were going to schedule um, a procedure to, to take out her eggs, to extract her eggs um, at a clinic. And literally we had had a conversation with the doctor about making it happen what it was going to cost and all of that and within that week she announced to us that she was pregnant with her second child so that was like an immediate immediate halt to our plan and um we had to kind of think about what plan b might be you know moving forward because she was going to have her own baby which is which was amazing but also a little bit disappointing for us um just because this was going to significantly impact our journey to becoming parents of our own. Um, so I think, you know, digging deeper into the actual process, I, it was, it was challenging at first because I didn't know anything about what surrogacy meant or how it worked or what it costed. And it was, there was a, a, a large barrier to entry um, for me. And I think it was actually Steve who told Rudy, about an agency, a surrogacy agency called Circle. And um, they're based on the East Coast, but I think at the time they were opening up um, an office in, on the West Coast and just outside of San Francisco. So we actually set up a meeting with them to talk about you know, what the process looks like and how to get started. And they were incredibly helpful in educating us and you know, teaching us about the process and what it looked like. Um, so yeah, that was that was really great. We we learned a lot. We talked about you know how it was going to go down, connecting us to professionals that were going to help us, like lawyers and doctors and all that stuff. Um, one thing one thing to point out that really shocked me um, was the the cost of having a kid. And you know it's it's listening to Alex and Caroline's story about you know what it costs in the EU and how it's all set up it's like a, an entirely different picture here. Um, when they, when the agency first told us about how much this was going to cost just to have one kid, they quoted us at just over, I had pulled it up just over $150,000, um, just for one kid. 
and they give you the option of doing twins if you wanted to do two at the same time. Um, but just one, so we were going to do IVF in vitro fertilization, just one cycle is $38,000. Um, or you can sign on to an unlimited plan is $44,000 um, and up to about $50,000 for your surrogate, depending on the state. Um, so, you know, that's astronomical and really not doable for many young couples. Um, so that was really a hard thing to kind of wrap my head around, and understand what that would look like for us or how we could make that happen. Now, in the case of my sister, we we potentially had an egg donor that was going to donate her eggs for free and we only had to pay for the for the IVF treatment. Um, you know, so there's ways to bring the cost down if we had an egg donor and a surrogate who were volunteering, um, it might cost us about $48,000. That was what they quoted us on. So, I mean, the difference between 50 grand and a thousand euros is a big difference, you know, and a huge barrier to entry um, and something that I definitely wasn't expecting. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how we got started. I hope that gives a good overview. I'll pass it to Rudy, who's going to tell you the second part of our journey. Yeah, I, um, thanks, Casey. Um, I think at that point, when when we realized what was happening and, and finding out the costs and, and the logistics of all of it, um, you know, we found ourselves in a position it's like, what do we do? Is it something that we can afford? Is it, you know, we're, we were, were also planning on buying a home and it's like, we have to pick one over the other. And um, things like that. So there, there's just all these walls, right, and hurdles in the way. Um, and and like listening to Alex and Caroline is just like, wow. It's sad that I'm thinking that I wish I lived in a, a um, that I wish I lived in another country, right? Like that they can get these things um, in Holland, a much smaller country, and we're one of the wealthiest if not the wealthiest nation in the world, and we cannot even provide, you know, basic services for, for LGBTQ families to, to form their families. Um, and, and I, and I shared, I shared a story with, with a friend of ours um, and she volunteered. Um, she volunteered to be our surrogate. And that is, you know, one of the biggest gifts that anybody can give to anyone, right. To give their body uh, and, and, and it's not just their body, it involves their family too, right? It involves their marriage, their children, um, you know, all this time and effort and uh, to do that. And we're, and we're so grateful. And we're, and we're so, so lucky that, that we found ourselves in this position where we have someone being the surrogate and, and it made it easier for us. Um, but of course, like this doesn't come without, you know, it's, it, it's issues in and of itself, right? Legal issues. Um, the way states recognize different states recognize it differently, um, and and legally the state that the person's in um, does not recognize uh, that child as our child. It actually recognizes it under that couple, right? The surrogate and her husband. That is the, when that child is born. It is legally their child because the law says that. Uh, in fact, the child will even have the last name of the father, um, even though the state does allow them to change the last name, but uh, the state recognizes the father, since this person's in a marriage, uh, recognizes the child as, as of that marriage and until it gets proven otherwise, until they cede uh, the rights to that child. And then uh, Casey and I have to adopt the child. Um, so there's this whole long process, right? It, the, the system is not made for family, families like ours. And we need legislators, we need voters, we need our political leaders to change it because we're people too, right? And, and there is more than one way to make a family. And that's the recognition that, that we're seeking. And, and the law should reflect that, that, that there are different ways to, to make families um, and that we need different support. Um, we need insurance companies to, to support some of the things that, that we're doing right, like they do for heterosexual couples. Um, so yeah, so for us, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's very hard. It's like, it's, it's, it's taught me a lot about our healthcare system. It's taught me a lot about our laws, um, the way we continue to be second class citizens, like we continue to be on the fringe. Um, and yeah, we had just had the Supreme court say that we can't be fired for being gay. And five years ago, yesterday, we were allowed to get married. Like, yes, we're, we're taking some big steps, but there's so 
much more to go. Like there, when we think about the way our our country is formed, the separation between the federal government, state governments, and local governments, they have hundreds of years of building policy around uh, straight couples, while ours is just fresh and new, and we have to like run to ca- try to catch up. Um, but if we're not out there, like all of you on this call, you guys are not out there supporting us and and taking this cause as your own, it will never happen. Like we like we need to we need to fight for it. Um, and and then so that that sorry that's my that's my political spiel on on on, on that. Um, but then our family is also multiracial, right? Like I'm Latino and, and Casey's white from upstate New York. I'm from Miami, Florida. My parents are from Nicaragua. His family is of Irish descent. Um, and then we have questions about like identities for our families, right? Like that was another thing that we had to talk about. And how do we pick a last name? And again, Steve, our hero, <laughs> I went to Steve and I'm like, Steve, you know, you have a multiracial family. Like, how did you guys deal with this? And it was like, well, um, it's like, how do you want to raise your kids? Like, do you want them to have, you know, the Latino identity and, and all that? And it's like, yeah, we want our children to know that they are brown and, and that um, even though, they our kids may look white that's a possibility um uh they need to recognize that um you know they're latino we want them to to learn growing up speaking spanish and understanding their history and their heritage um and and also you know growing up want them to grow up in an area where they can be protected like their family structure is protected and that they can go to schools that understand their family structure is different uh, that's that's like the reason why I joined the board of our family coalition um, was because this organization is specifically dedicated to at, at the beginning stages like teaching LGBTQ peoples how they can form a family, the different ways that that can take place, and then also um, educating uh, educators like teachers and families and even students on LGBTQ history and what it's like to foster a safe and healthy environment for children that are born or that are brought into um, LGBTQ families um, and what that looks like, right? And understanding the dynamics of that. So all these things are really, really important. Um, so yeah, that, that's, our, that's our story. That's, that's incredible, guys. Thank you so much for sharing. I actually, um, we, we are friends. I did not know all of that story. Um, and it is stunning the amount of work that you guys have had to go through that a, a, a heterosexual couple just wouldn't have half the experience of. Um, and I really cross my fingers that your surrogacy works quickly. Um, I would like to move to um, Vice Mayor Palmer. Um, and I know you mentioned you have two sons with your spouse. Um, and your sons are a little bit older. And in your intro, you were talking a little bit um, about what it was like for you and your partner to start a family. Um, I'd love for you to expand on that and also um, go back to the the comments you made about deciding to run for office because that sounded like a really powerful statement. Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you everybody, Vice Mayor uh, Parmer Lohan, Laura Parmer Lohan, um, City of San Carlos. It's a small community here on the peninsula of about 30,000 people. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, um, my wife and I have been together for 30 years and, uh, I made an active choice, um, when I first moved to San, San Francisco at the time, um, to not be politically active. It was during the AIDS crisis. Um, and what I wanted to do was I really wanted to just assimilate and demonstrate, you know, that gay people are real people too too <laughs> and so um you know years later when i found myself running for office it was something i never expected to do uh, because i um i wanted to use my voice in a different way right so we like i said we did the domestic partner uh, we got married under then gavin newsom when he was mayor of san francisco um, that was annulled by the state and then we were married again during the summer of 2008 um, and uh, along the way, we started a family, and we um, have uh, now two beautiful boys, uh, 18 and 16. And the 18-year-old is about ready to go off to college, so that's pretty exciting. And, you know, as you touched on earlier, um, it was a really thoughtful process um, and not something that we took lightly. It actually took us many years to determine whether or not we wanted to do it, and at, at that time, uh, during the AIDS crisis, there was still a lot of vitriol in the community, and um, we were both, for the most part, 
uh, not out in many respects. And, um, you know, once though we decided to have a family, we recognized that that would have to go away, right? It, uh, just having kids, it forces you to be differently in, in the community. But we spent a lot of money on lawyers uh, and our straight colleagues didn't have to do that. Uh, we had to have a social visit, a social services visit, visit us, come into our home and do um, an, uh, an assessment, which was um, really disappointing, um, you know, because again, you know, we see the world around us and many people can just choose to have children and <laughs> they don't have to go through the same hoops. So um, it was a little bit, um, felt, it felt a little bit, um, it made us feel a bit vulnerable. Um, and then, uh, you know, after the kids arrived, we made a really conscientious decision that we were going to be really active in our communities. And we were fortunate in that in the beginning, Kathy didn't have to work. We had relocated to San Diego for a while where I grew up and the cost of living is a lot less. And so she began to volunteer in the schools. And uh, the purpose behind that was uh, you know, to have people have an opportunity to get to, get to know us as a family and really, um, you know, again, to that strategy of assimilating and just showing everybody that we're just like everyone else. This the composition uh, is a little bit different. Um, we felt like that was a really powerful thing. And I'm pleased to report that our kids never had any issues um, and still have it to this day. And I'm also really pleased to see how much the conversation has changed. And I'm just, um, when they got to middle school, um, many of their their peers uh, started to come out and um, not just being gay or lesbian but also um, gender fluid or um, uh, trans and and so that was really encouraging for for me to see so I think that we've come a long way uh, that being said I think we still have a ways to go and I think it's important um, you know for all of us to advocate for that which is important so um, Ken, Ken Yeager uh, was uh, Santa Clara County supervisor for many years and I met him on my journey when I was running for office and he was uh, the first uh, person when he was on City Council for San Jose to raise the pride flag, pride flag in his community um, well over 25 years ago at, at a time again when it was not popular to do so it wasn't a thing and it took a tremendous amount of courage and uh, he took a, he had his staff take a picture of the two of us in front of that flag that hung in his then office and what he said to me was, you know, um, I was looking for somebody to represent me um, in elected office and advocate for me. And I realized that no one was going to do it unless I did it for myself. And um, I have to tell you that that was a really, that, that was an epiphany for me. And so after I got elected to office, one of the things I asked of my other council members, um, because I'm one of five and I don't make unilateral you know, decisions, we have to make them together. I asked with great fear and trepidation for them to consider raising the pride flag, not knowing what the outcome would be. Um, and there was a very um, quiet, the room was quiet. So I didn't think that I had acceptance for that. Um, but luckily I have an innovative city manager <laughs> and he found a way for us to raise the flag. And when it was announced to council that that was what was gonna happen, they were actually upset uh, that they didn't get to actually make the decision, which I thought was fascinating. Um, so uh, I was, you know, sorry that they wouldn't be, able, they weren't able to experience that, but it seemed a bit ironic to me that they, <laughs> given what we've been through, that they would be upset about that. But it just shows, I guess, how far we've come. Um, so I'm going to stop there because I think you might have some other questions for some of the other panelists. But I would just encourage everyone, you know, to be an ally of marginalized communities. Um, donate uh, to uh, candidates and, and causes that matter to you. Uh, write uh, letters to your representatives. It does make a difference. I, I read everything I get and um, and buy and read determined to be a dad. Uh, there's 19 different ways to make a family or at least that was the case when we were creating ours. Um, I don't know if there's more now or not, but uh, lots of think lots to lots to think about. Wow. Um, I'm I, I am taking notes as people are writing for the summary here. And some of the things that you guys have said are just so powerful, um, just listening to them. So I really um, appreciate you taking the time to share with, to share with us. Um, I would like to transition to hear a little bit from Steve Disselhorst about his book. Um, I'd love to hear about your family building story, Steve, and listen to a little bit of your book um, to give us an idea of what we're about to be reading. Cool. So, um, so thank you, 
This is a copy of my book that just was published uh, on June 16th. So really excited to get it out there. Um, my, my journey to become a parent was really, um, you know, I grew up in a really large, uh, I had 25 first cousins, um, just a huge family and sort of a heterosexual, uh, heteronormative family was what I always um, was accustomed to. I, I never questioned that I would be a parent until uh, when I was about 20 years old and I noticed that I was looking at men and not women. And I was very troubled by that because it meant to me that um, I couldn't be a parent if I was going to be attracted to men. And I struggled. Uh, I'm also Catholic from a very, uh, you know, religious family. Um, and I really struggled with my attraction to men and the thought that I, I couldn't be a dad. And I came out um, basically 30 years ago, it was, it was in the heart of the AIDS epidemic. Um, I moved to the Bay area in 1990. Um, and there were, you know, this was before there was any antivirals prep. There were literally, you would be walking in the Castro and you would see men that were, um, you know, that, you know, on their, on their last leg, um, completely emaciated. So having a family was really not nothing that I thought I could do in the nineties. Um, it was really stay safe and stay un, uh, uninfected. And, and, um, it was a very scary time to make a decision to come out, but I did it, um, despite all of that. Um, and then as things started to change and, um, there was, there was more hope around um, creating families. And then I finally met my, um, my husband in 2003. And then we went through a process of um, discussing uh, family formation and then finally decided um, to adopt. So our, my story is a little different from the other panelists today. And I'm actually gonna read um, a, a short portion of the book around uh, our adoption journey. Um, and uh, then we'll go from there. So it's um, chapter 10, and it's um, the ups and downs of adoption. After the long and grueling process of getting approved to be adoptive pa parents, we were finally ready to meet birth parents. In April of 2010, we were finally live on the Independent Adoption Center website, and our profile was open to prospective birth parents. At that time, two and a half years felt like the longest wait of our lives. That was how long we waited for our daughter. The National Adoption Center estimates the wait for a healthy baby is typically between two and seven years. By those standards, two and a half years seem like a flash in the pan, but it's still a long time to put your life and dreams on hold. Those first six months of preparation felt like a mad, dad, mad rush to get everything turned in. Once everything was submitted and we were listed, we thought we'd be flooded with calls. We expected the phone to be ringing off the hook the moment we got the green light. We were constantly checking our phones and making sure our 1-800 number was working and transferring calls to our cell phone. And we didn't get so much as a crank call that first month. The Independent Adoption Center tried to set the right expectations to help us prepare for the wait that would ensue. There were at least 200 families ahead of us at our agency alone, all vying for that one child but their advice went in one ear and out the other. All we cared about was matching with the birth parents and holding our bundle of joy. We were ready to be fathers. We were ready for the bottle feeding. We were ready for the diaper changes. We were ready for the sleepless nights and we wanted our child and we wanted it now. Our placement social worker, Annie, gave us a false sense of hope in an off the cuff remark. She said something along the lines of, as a mixed race gay professional couple, she thought our wait would be shorter. The official agency advice was an average of 18 months of waiting prior to finding our child. Annie explained that many birth mothers placing children for adoption preferred a two man household because the birth mothers did not feel like they were being replaced by another mother. We thought there was finally an advantage to being gay. In the months and years that follow, we were contacted by 14 different women in very sta varying stages of pregnancy. Most were legitimate while others felt like they were running scams or their stories just didn't ring true. Yet we took every phone call, email, and text that came through seriously 
wondering if our future children, child and birth family were on the other side of the call. None of these contacts resulted in an actual live meeting. Our first call was nerve wracking. We were so nervous that we saw a number come through that we didn't recognize. We played hot potato with the phone saying, you take it, no, you take it. I don't know what to say. The Independent Adoption Center provided us with su suggested questions and talking points to break the ice in these very awkward conversations. We had those qu questions pinned above our desks and role played how the call would go. Needless to say, all the preparation in the world never got us ready for the first call. We had dry periods where we were wondering if we we'd ever be contacted again. There would be months where we wouldn't hear anything or other months where we were juggling two birth mothers at once. During our adoption journey, we encountered many women and a couple of men with unique stories and reasons for considering adoption. While these women were all pregnant, which was their commonality, that is where it ended. Every story and situation was unique and very personal. During our journey in post-adoption, when we shared our adoption story with people, there was a common stereotype of the birth mothers. Most people assumed that the birth mothers were young and addicted to drugs and or alcohol and didn't have the means to support these children. We had heard very hurtful things such as, how could any mother give away her child? These comments and conversations were full of judgment, animus, and disgust. There was a demonizing of and a lack of compassion for these women and some men who had to make incredibly difficult decisions. Unfortunately, much of this language and stereotypes are accepted as truths in our culture. These words and feelings also lack empathy toward our plight to become parents. These people did not understand the gratitude we felt, our unique bond with these birth parents. I can say in no uncertain terms that I have the utmost respect, gratitude, and love for these birth parents. I think of them often, wonder that how they are doing, and send them love and well wishes. In our home, we have the ritual of praying over our meals, and we always pray for my children's birth parents. There isn't a day that doesn't go by when I don't think, when I don't thank them for the gift of my children. There isn't a day that doesn't that goes by when I don't thank God for the gift of being a parent. Wow, thank you for that, Steve. You're welcome. Um, I, I would love to hear you expand a little bit on what inspired you to write write the book. Yeah, so um, I was inspired by as we went through the process and after the process when um, we would talk with people about our journey. Um, many people were like, wow, that's really amazing. Um, and I thought to myself, well, I know a fair amount of people. I don't have um, visibility to the world, right? Like the, there's a huge amount of uh, LGBTQ people that want to have families. And um, in 2018, uh, the Family Equality Council did some research on millennials and 3.8 million millennials, 77% of millennial LGBTQ people are considering families. So when I heard that statistic, I said to myself, there's a lot of people out there that need to understand the journey both the internal journey of deciding if you think you could be a parent. I write a lot about that in my book around, you know, as a gay man, societal messaging around you, you know, early, you know, around being weird or a pedophile or all of these horrible things, right? There's this messaging to us that we're not capable of parenting. And so I think um, for me, I wanted to share with the world, I had doubts that I could do it. Um, and I went into those doubts and really, um, felt into them and thought about them. And then I figured out I could do it. And then I found a man that wanted to do it with me. And then it was really, then finally we decided we wanted to do it. And I, and then we had to wait and wait and wait and go through a lot of red tape. And so I, I wanted to share that with um, LGBTQ people, but also heterosexual people that are um, considering alternative methods. I, I'm hearing a lot about um, with, uh, uh, the overpopulation of our planet that a lot of millennials are thinking about adoption as a way to not overpopulate the planet. So there's a lot of people that are thinking about adoption for reasons um, 
other than just being a two head, uh, two, two men household. So uh, that, that's the re really the reason I wrote the book. Um, I just wanted to mention to folks that um, Steve's book is, again, is titled Determined to be Dad um, and is actually available right now on Amazon. And Rudy will drop the link in the chat. Um, thank you. And I want, I want to thank you again. I actually want to thank all the panelists for taking the time tonight to share your stories with us. Um, I don't know if you're all aware when you're speaking, but just sitting, listening to you, there were some commonalities that came across in everyone's stories. And some of you actually, several of you said it directly, but it all um, came to the message that we are just like everyone else and we want to be have the same experiences um, as everyone else. And the quote several people used was, we just want to be seen as, as normal humans. Um, and I thought that was, um, I was struck that that was how that phrase came out um, because I don't see our LGBT community in any other way. And, but that's really that there is so much work to be done that people are using that phrase to identify the challenge that's happening right now. And we as a society need to be really aware about how much work we have left to do um, to make sure that everyone feels like this is not an insurmountable barrier to figure out how to put a family to, together that that is what you are aiming to have. Um, I do want to take an opportunity here to ask folks if they have any questions for our panelists. If you do have one, go ahead and drop it in the chat link below. Uh, the chat is at the bottom. If you're not a Zoom common user, if you go down below, there's a thing that says chat next to participants. If not, I think we will thank all our panelists one more time for taking the time to speak to us all tonight and wish you all a safe and happy weekend. Oh, I think there might be one. Qu oh, no. Is there one? I can't. If, if people are raising their hand, I don't know how to somebody direct me to that. But otherwise, you know. Nope. I see. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see any questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. you. Thanks. Have a great weekend. Happy Pride, everyone. Happy Pride, everyone. Great to see y'all. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing the discussion. Happy to have you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.